Yes, well, these meetings have been concerned with the, really the, the question of thought, or really, and, and the way it, what what it's been doing in the world, right? And just by way of a review, uh, and we can, we all know that the world is in a, a difficult situation and has been basically for a long time. That now we have many crises. Uh, uh, you know, in addition to the latest one in the Middle East, which has no no clear solution, we we have also the ecological crisis, which people have, which has gone on the back burner, I think, <laughs> and uh, we have economic crises developing, and we have the fact that there's nationalism all over, and people don't seem to have all sorts of hatreds, and we have religious hatred and. Uh, inability of people to get together to face the common problems such as the ecological one or the economic one. Everything is interdependent and yet the more interdependent we get it seems the more we split up into little groups that uh, don't like each other uh, and uh, are inclined to fight each other and kill each other or uh, at least not to cooperate. And uh, so um, one begins to wonder whether it will be possible, what is going to happen to the human race. Uh, technology keeps on advancing <clears throat> with greater and greater power, uh, either for good or for destruction. And yet, uh, it seems that it tends to be used more and more. There's always this danger of destruction. Right? We no sooner had this rivalry between America and the West and the East, or uh, sort of dissolved away, and uh, then we have this problem, the Middle East pops up, and doubtless another one will pop up later and so on. <laughs> it's sort of endemic, it's not just, uh, 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 it's not just uh, something that occasionally happens. <laughs> and it's, it's in the whole situation. Now, uh, I think we're all familiar with that situation. And uh, uh, if you think of technology advancing, keep. Uh, you have nuclear bombs which will perhaps soon be available to people like Saddam or to somebody else if he goes. <laughs> and uh, you have biological weapons and chemical weapons and what other kinds of weapons they haven't yet invented but surely will. <laughs> and, uh, and then you have that the faster we, either we go into a depression which will help save the ecology <laughs> or we go into a boom which will make us happy but it will ruin the ecology. <laughs> I mean, the faster we go into prosperity, the faster we create all those other problems. So it seems whichever way you turn, it doesn't um, work. And why not? You see, what's going? Uh, is there any way out? You see, uh, uh, will can you imagine in a hundred years of this, or two hundred, or five hundred? It won't lead to some gigantic catastrophe, either to the ecology or in some other way. And uh, uh, perhaps war. Who knows? Now, uh, the uh, uh, so it seems that we have to, people have been dealing with this piecemeal, looking at symptoms, right? saying we've got to solve this problem or that problem or that problem, but uh, there's something deeper which is constantly generating these problems which people haven't been considering. Right? The way I used to have the analogy that there's a stream and people are pouring pollution upstream and they're trying to remove it downstream. <laughs> but as they remove it, they, must, they may add some more of a different kind. <laughs> so, the, uh, uh, wh what is the source of all this trouble, you see? Hmm? Uh, now, that, that is really what we've been concerned with in all these dialogues of the past few years. And, uh, and, and uh, we're coming back to the source is basically in thought, I'm saying, and those of you who come will have heard this several, once or twice or more before, uh, the, uh, uh, which many people would think is crazy. You see, the thought is the one thing we have to solve our problems, right? That's part of our tradition. Right? And uh, see, it looks as if the thing we use to solve our problems is the source of our problems. You know? It's. Uh, uh, it's like going to the doctor and he'll make you ill. In fact, in 20% of the cases, apparently, we do have that going on. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, uh, but in the case of thought, it's far over 20%. <laughs> I say that the, uh, 
so the, the reason why we don't see the source of our problems is that the means by which we try to solve them are the source. <laughs> so, <coughs> the, uh, uh, but that may seem strange to somebody who's first heard it, uh, uh, because our whole culture prides itself on thought as the, its highest achievement. And, and it's the achievements of thought, I'm not trying to say, are negligible. They are very great achievements in technology and various other ways and culture. But uh, there's another side to it which is leading to our destruction that we have to look at. <coughs> so the... Uh, uh, now, what is wrong... Or say, I'll try to say what is wrong with thought. I'll try to give some brief summary and we might start talking about it if you like. Uh, well, one of the obvious things wrong, wrong with it is fragmentation. <coughs> uh, the, uh, uh, the, the thought is breaking things up into bits which should not be broken up. You see, we can see this going on. We see the world is broken up into nations, more and more nations. Russia had no sooner got rid of the communist dictatorship when it's breaking up into a lot of little bits. <laughs> which obviously can't manage, and uh, they're all fighting each other, and, and it's a source of concern that they're doing this, a concern for the whole world, right? Uh, you have new nation, nations all over the world. Uh, uh, you know, I was reading recent, an article about during the Second World War, the nationalism developed in Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. They say Lithuania for the Lithuanians, Latvia for the Latvians, I don't know, Armenia for the Armenians, and so on and so on. Uh, it's all broken up, and yet the world is all one, right? The more technology develops, the more people depend on each other, and, and people try to pretend it's not so, right? So they say the nation is sovereign, it can do what it like, you see, and yet it can't, right? Uh, the United States can't do what it like because it depends a lot on other countries for supplies of all sorts, oil, and it depends on Japan for money, <laughs> apparently, <laughs> and so on. So uh, the... Uh, now, uh, Japan can't do what it like, obviously. Uh, so, uh, uh, it seems very hard for people to accept this simple fact, seriously. Uh, and nations get to fight each other and kill each other. They, becomes, they say, for the nation you must sacrifice everything, or for your religious differences you sacrifice everything. We split into religions. You see, we split into racial groups and saying that's all important, or and all sorts of splits into, inside each nation, there are various splits, you know, uh, you can see people are divided up uh, and into sections and into all kinds of interests, and, uh, and then it goes on down to the family and, and inside families and so on. People are supposed to be getting together, but they can't. <laughs> and, see, the nation, we have the boundary of the nation, you say, we've established a nation. Now, that's invented by thought, right? Who, if you go to the edge of the nation, there's nothing there particular, <laughs> and, unless somebody made a fence, right? <laughs> and now, <clears throat> so uh, it's the same country. The people may often be not very different, but it's all important what's one side or the other. It's thought that makes it so, you see. Uh, I was informed that most of the nations of the Middle East were invented either by the British or the French, who, that their various uh, bureaucrats drew lines and said, that's the boundary of this nation, that nation, that nation, and there they were. Now they all have to fight each other, <laughs> you see. So, the, uh, 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 now, uh, well, uh, then you have professional groups. Uh, if you are in science, you see every little specialty is fragmented from every other, and people hardly know what's happening in a somewhat different field, and, uh, uh, and it goes on. Uh, uh, knowledge is fragmented. Uh, everything gets broken up. You see, now, what is broken up is something... In other words, what we are doing is establishing boundaries where really there's a close connection. That's what's wrong with fragmentation. And at the same time, trying to establish unity where there isn't any, <laughs> or not very much. Right inside the boundary, we say we're all one, but when you look at all these groups, they're not all one at all. Right? <laughs> they're all fighting each other inside as much as they're fighting outside. So, we have false division and false unification. Right? In other words, thought is pretending that there's a sharp division here, and, uh, and really everything is unified inside when it's all not so. So this is a fictional way of thinking. The question is, we say, to go on with this fictional way of thinking seems to be very important, so important that the actual fact that it's wrong is ignored. <laughs> you see, so uh, that it's not that way at all. <clears throat> so uh, 
Uh, so then it seems strange why why should people do such a strange thing? It seems it really would be could be thought of as irrational, or at the very least, or crazy, perhaps. Or, you know that so much trouble is created out of such small things. Right? Uh, you know, which may prevent our survival even. Right? Uh, so, uh, well now, uh, that, that's only, uh, but then that that's fragmentation is itself a symptom of some more general difficulty with thought, or a particular case of it. Right? Uh, because there's a more general difficulty with thought is that thought is very active and participatory. It's always doing a great deal, but it all, all is tending to say it hasn't done anything. But it's just telling you the way things are, right? right? You see, thought has created everything you see here in this building around. It has affected all, how all the trees are. It has affected the mountains. It has affected the plains and the farms and the factories and the, the science and technology and uh, uh, even at the South Pole, you have quite a bit of, you may have, you have the destruction of the ozone layer, which is basically due to thought, because people thought that they want to have a refrigerant, a nice, safe refrigerant, and they uh, built this all up by thinking more and more about it, and, uh, and now we have the ozone layer, you see, being destroyed. So, uh, the, uh, 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 see, thought has produced tremendous effects outwardly, and it will discuss further on, it produces tremendous effects inwardly in each person. And yet, the general tacit assumption in thought is that it's just telling you the way things are, not doing anything, and that you are inside there deciding what to do with that information. <laughs> but I want to say that you don't decide what to do with the information. The information takes over and runs you. You see, that thought runs you. Uh, but it also gives the false information that you are running it, right? <laughs> that you are the one who controls thought, whereas thought is the one who controls each one of us, right? If we don't, those, uh, until thought is understood, which, uh, or better yet, uh, uh, more than understood, perceived, uh, it will actually control us, hmm? under the, but create the impression that it is our servant. Hmm? It is just doing what we want it to do. Uh, now, uh, th th see, that's the difficulty. The thought is participating and then saying it's not participating, it's taking part, it's in everything. Hmm? Uh, now, that it's fragmentation is a particular case of that. You see, thought is creating divisions out of itself and then saying they're there naturally. The, the divisions between nations are regarded as being just there, you see. But obviously they were invented by people, and people came to accept them, and that made them be there. Right? Mm. Uh, the same holds for the divisions between religions. Every religion was invented by somebody thinking that he had a certain idea about God, and that uh, uh, that was right and true, and, and eventually other religions weren't right, and, uh, the, and eventually that you could catch that the other religions were inferior, or perhaps even uh, heretical, or, or evil, or wrong, and you could fight them, you know, try to suppress them and destroy them. And there were vast religious wars, and in fact we may still have some more coming. <laughs> so, <clears throat> in spite of all the development of the enlightened knowledge, and science and technology, the f in fact science and technology now it seems to serve at least equally well those who are perhaps at a more medieval level than it serves those who are regard themselves as more advanced, right? <clears throat> so, uh, uh, anybody can use it, you see, and uh, <clears throat> now, the, uh, without fundamentally altering his own <clears throat> frame of mind which governs why, how it's used. <clears throat> so, uh, therefore, in saying that thought has this character, that it uh, is doing something and says it do didn't do it. Now, we, we have to uh, really go into that because we could discuss that a great deal because it's doing, what it's doing is very much more subtle than I've said. That's only the beginning. Uh, now, then again, another problem is fragmentation is that thought divides from 
feeling and from the body. Thought is said to be the mind, some sort of abstract or spiritual or immaterial. We have that feeling. And then you have the body, very physical, and then you have emotions somewhere in between, perhaps. And the idea is they're all different, right? Now, we think of them as different, and we experience them as different because we think of them as different, right? Hmm? Uh, so, but see, thought is not so different from emotion. Uh, if you think something, if you think that a certain person has treated you badly, you will get angry, you see. We'll discuss that more later, but uh, uh, a very elementary example is that if, if somebody uh, keeps you waiting for a couple of hours and you can get very angry thinking, you know, what does he mean treating me like this? You know, he has no concern, consideration for me. And you can think of various things, he's always doing it and so on. By thinking that way, you can get very angry. And then if he comes and says the train was late, it's, it goes. So it shows its thought, right? By changing your thought, the anger evaporates. <laughs> so thought at least sustains that feeling. And uh, the, uh, uh, you can see the thought of something pleasant will make you feel good. You see, the thought that you're doing well or great will make you feel good inside. The adrenaline will, will be, you know, all the good feelings will come out. And the thought that you have done something wrong or the thought that you're guilty may make you feel miserable. <laughs> If somebody says you are guilty, which is a thought, then you can feel very miserable, right? Uh, so, uh, th so feelings are tremendously affected by thoughts, and obviously thoughts are tremendously affected by feelings. Because if you're angry, you don't think clearly. Now, if you have a feeling of pleasure in something, you may find yourself reluctant to give up the idea that gives you pleasure, even if it's wrong, <laughs> right? You engage in self-deception. So the feelings and thoughts affect each other, and I gave this example many times, but it's a good one. There's a good physical reason for that, which you can see in the structure of the brain. Uh, see, there, there's a very thick bundle of nerves. There's an intellectual center in the cortex and the, pre uh, and the outer layers of the brain, and deeper down there's an emotional center. And then between them is a very thick bundle of nerves by which they communicate very closely. <laughs> So they must be connected, you see. Now then, there was this famous case in the 19th century of an iron pin which an explosion drove through the man's brain. He had been a very level-headed man and so on, but he recovered apparently from this. Um, it came right out, you see. Then he recovered and he was physically okay, but emotionally he was totally unbalanced and intellectually he couldn't maintain any very consistent line of thought. <laughs> so. The, the breaking of the connection of the emotional and the uh, intellectual centers prevented the system from functioning. Right? <laughs> you see, what happens is that the intellectual center will normally tell whether an emotion is appropriate or not. That's what happened when you were angry, somebody being to, uh, delaying you two hours and somebody else came and said the train was late, you believed him. Then the, the, emotion, the intellectual center said there's no longer any good reason to be angry and the emotional center duly I said, okay, no reason, I give up, I give up my anger. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> now, uh, so, uh, the, uh, uh, and vice versa, the emotional center may be sending, uh, may, is pick, you know, may send um, information saying that there is danger, there is this or that, and the intellectual center picks it up and tries to find out what is the danger. <laughs> it thinks. So, uh, therefore, they're intimately and closely related. The very wish to think must come from an emotion or from an impulse to think. Which, and and uh, uh, so they're, they're really almost two sides of the same process. Right? Uh, but our language separates them and our thought separates them. They're fragmented. You see, we, we introduce in our thought a very sharp division just back between nations where there really isn't such a division. Uh, we're introducing a fictional way of thinking about this situation. Hmm? And if our thinking is fictional, it will mislead us. I mean, now, the, uh, uh, that's really... Uh, so we have this question that emotions and intellect are closely connected, and I think it's worth repeating what I've said the last two years, that in the language we have a distinction, thinking and thought. Right? thought thinking is the present uh, sense of the thing, and uh, some activity going on which may include some critical uh, sensitivity to what may go wrong and also some new ideas and perception of some kind of insight occasionally. But uh, then thought is the past of that. So 
thinking doesn't disappear. Another idea we have is that when we've been thinking something, it just goes, but it doesn't. It goes somehow into the brain and leaves something, a trace, which becomes thought, right? And the thought now acts automatically. So, uh, therefore, if you have been thinking for a while that I have a good reason to be angry, it's there, and then you remain angry. Uh, so, uh, that, that I, so we have thinking and thought. Thought is the response from memory, from the past, right? Hmm? Of what has been done. And then you have the word feeling, which suggests that it's always just active present. <laughs> it's just telling you, it's just directly in contact with reality. Hmm? But, in fact, if we introduce the, the English wor word felt, say there are feelings and felts, right? There, there are feelings which have been recorded, and we know that they're there because you may remember pleasure that you had and get a sense of pleasure. You remember pain you had and you get a sense of pain. A traumatic experience in the past can make you feel very uncomfortable and remembered, <laughs> and, uh, and so on. So, uh, nostalgic feelings and so on, you know, are there from the past. And the, uh, so, you, you know that uh, there are, a lot of the feelings come up are really from the past, they're felt. And by failing to make this distinction, we are often give too much importance to some feelings which actually don't have that much significance. Right? If they are recorded, if, if they are just the recording being replayed, they don't have as much significance as if they were a response to the present immediate situation. Mm -hmm. Now, you see, if you respond according to the way you felt a long time ago, or the way you got used to feeling, say, when I was a child, a certain situation made me feel uncomfortable, or, you know, you're... Uh, and then, uh, when any similar situation arises, now you feel uncomfortable. Now, you only get that discomfort, but you don't see it doesn't mean anything, right? Mm -hmm. But you're, it does seem to mean a great deal. <laughs> it affects you, right? You see, so failing, uh, see, so that false division between thinking and feeling, and also the whole state of the body, right? Because uh, well, according to the way you think, you will get adrenaline flowing, you know, you will get neurochemicals affected all over the body. For example, if you see a shadow and you know, you have, know that there are, you may, there are people around who might attack you, then you immediately get a feeling of fear and you get adrenaline flowing, your muscles tense, your heart beats, just from the knowledge that there may be uh, assailants in the neighborhood. <laughs> as soon as you look and say it's a shadow, it goes, the knowledge that it, this doesn't happen to be one of those assailants, <laughs> and it goes, right? So, there's a profound connection between the state of the body and the way you think, and if people are constantly worried about their, under stress, about their jobs or something, the, they may stir up their stomachs too much and get ulcers, you know, and various other things, and it's well known. So, uh, the uh, state of the body is very profoundly tied to uh, thought, right? It's affected by thought and vice versa. So, uh, uh, and that, that's another kind of fragmentation we have to uh, watch out for, right? Now, all of that will tend to introduce uh, quite a bit of uh, confusion or what I call incoherence into our thinking, uh, you see, uh, or into our action. Hmm? Because what happens is that you will not get the results you expect. You see, that's the first, the major sign of incoherence. You want to do something, but it doesn't come out that way, right? Hmm. Hmm. And, uh, and uh, that, that's a sign that you have some wrong information somewhere, that, uh, usually. Hmm. I mean, if you expect something that you act that way and it doesn't happen, is that clear? Hmm? And the right approach would be to say, yes, that's incoherent, let me try to find out the wrong information and change it. Hmm? But now, the trouble is we find there's a lot of incoherence where people don't do that, you see. If somebody likes to be flattered, you see, in some sense, he also doesn't want to be taken advantage of, right? But he finds that the person who flatters him can take advantage of him, right? He, it happens again and again and again, and he doesn't want that, but... So you would say, well, there's an incoherence there, because it is not his intention to be taken advantage of, right? <laughs> but still, he has another intention he uh, doesn't think about, which is he wants the glow of feeling that would come from flattery, right? Now, one implies the other, because if he accepts that 
then he also will accept the truth of what the person says and a lot of other things he can be taken advantage of. So he's got incoherent, he's got a, a, a conscious intention and another one which, go, which is resist to going against it, right? Hmm? Is that, that's a very common situation. It's the same between, with nationalism. You see, people didn't set up nations in order to uh, suffer the way they've suffered, to suffer endless wars and ha hate and starvation and disease and annihilation and slavery and <laughs> whatnot. That was not their intention when they set up the nation, nations to do that, but that's what happened. And it would inevitably happen. Now, the point is nobody ever looked at na the nation and said, what's it all about? They said, at all costs, we have got to go on with this nation, but we don't want these consequences. <laughs> right? And therefore, they struggled against the consequences without, while well, they kept on producing the situation. See, that is the third feature of thought, that it, it doesn't know it's doing something, and then it struggles against that. It doesn't want to know it's doing it, right? <laughs> and it struggles against the result, trying to avoid the, the unpleasant result while keeping on with the way of thinking. Hmm. See, that's what I call sustained incoherence, you see. Not, there would be simple incoherence, which you're always going to have, because no, thoughts are always incomplete, you know, we always find our thoughts are not quite right, and we therefore have to say, if, if we find out what's happening becomes contradictory, confused, or isn't doing what we expect, then we should change our thoughts, right? <laughs> and try to make it better. But, and in simple situations, we do, right? But when it comes to things that matter to us, we don't. <laughs> now, that's rather odd, because in the things that matter are the place where we ought to be coherent, especially. <laughs> but we feel that only the things that don't matter too much, we can afford to be coherent, right? <laughs> See, which is another kind of incoherence, because we, we really, nobody has the intention of producing that sort of situation. <laughs> we See, we are producing these situations contrary to our conscious intentions. <laughs> There's another resistance going on, which we're not very conscious of. So whenever we intend to do something, we often have unconsciously a resistance trying to prevent us from doing it. <laughs> it's a big waste of energy, obviously. In any way, it's very destructive. Huh? It, it means we can't, we will produce problems without end that have no solution. Huh? In other words, uh, See, suppose we say, well, the Russians finally in America, and the West got together finally for various reasons. And, but meanwhile, for various other reasons, people had been sending a lot of arms into the Middle East. Right? It was not their intention to produce this impossible situation we have now. They said, well, we're sending arms to the Middle East for various reasons. You know, we want to make money, some of us. Or we, want to, we have a certain national policy which calls for doing that. There were various reasons. Right? And uh, then it all added up to this situation. Right? If there had been no arms there, it would not be so serious. Right? <laughs> so, uh, also, in 73, there was a dis it was plainly brought out that we were very dependent on Middle Eastern oil, which was a very unstable region. Right? Uh, so, uh, for a while, people began to use oil more efficiently, or energy more efficiently, but then gradually they stopped. Right? Uh, and then they say, look, surprise, we now depend for half the oil of the world is there. <laughs> if, if, that's, if that goes, we're all finished. <laughs> so, the, uh, 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 once again, see, it was not people's intention to, to produce this situation, but rather, they may say, we don't want this situation, but there are a lot of other things we've got to have <laughs> which will produce this situation, is that clear? So, there was an incoherence, right? Hmm? Uh, we're constantly producing things we don't intend. Then we say, look, we've got a problem. We don't realize that it was our deeper, in, our hidden intentions which have produced it and keep on. Even now, very little is being done, as, I, as far as I can see, about uh, using energy more efficiently and thus becoming less dependent on that oil, <laughs> which, which would uh, remove most of, the, almost the whole problem. <laughs> now, uh, the, uh, uh, so, uh, 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 you must ask, why is there this incoherence? I mean, nobody wants that situation, and yet people want things which will inevitably produce it, right? Hmm? They think it's thought that makes people say that's necessary. Right? Hmm? See, so, that, uh, so therefore thought has come to this kind of incoherence, and I think that's really the kind of... <coughs> uh, introduction uh, well, 
maybe we should talk a little about it now, and I'd say a little more later about this whole thing, if people want to discuss it. Or is that too uh, depressing to discuss? Thinking on the point about thinking and thought and the difference, you proposing that <coughs> you slide from thinking into thought without being aware we've done it? Yeah. Well, it's automatic, you see, because when we've been thinking, it gets recorded somewhere then that becomes thought. I'll, I'll discuss later how that thought is an active uh, set of uh, movements, right? A reflex. You see, suppose you keep on thinking. You see, the people of that start out with very young children. People of that group are no good, no good, no good. And then it becomes thought which just springs up. They're no good. In fact, you hardly notice that you're thinking, that there's any thought even, right? Hmm. Even now, in conversation in this group, while you're talking, there's a process of thinking, and which is, as you said, alive, or more in the present. And then this other stuff happening to us, which is thought, and we don't seem to have the ability to distinguish the two. No, well, we, we don't seem to distinguish the two. But we say... We, well, sometimes we do, because sometimes we say, I thought that before, you know. But generally, we may miss the distinction. Huh? And with feeling, it's even harder to see that dif distinction between what we, with the past, the, fe the past feeling coming up, I call it the felt, and something which would be an active present feeling, right? I wonder how much of the fracturing is taught in the Newtonian and Christian model, the Christian model of the fracturing. I mean, how much is our brain intrinsic? I and mean, this is actually its behavior, its normal, natural behavior. I mean, I remember in grade schools being taught to fracture, classify, and disorganize, take things apart. And my interior was violently against it because I saw this whole knitted skein as a as a as an uneducated person. So I'm wondering whether the brain naturally wants to fracture and analyze, or well, whether it's part of the way we teach ourselves. Well, that it is, to some extent, part of the result of the way we are taught, I'm sure. Huh? The, uh, I think there is some tendency in thought to constantly build this up, you see. So, so you think it's partly intrinsic, and it's, part, well, it's the nature of the brain? Not the brain, well, in the way thought has been developing. You see, uh, I think, see, first of all, a certain amount of analysis is necessary for clarity of thought. Right? Some distinctions have to be made, right? Now, we then carry them too far right? without, and we slip over. And there's, once we carry them too far, then we start registering it, and that becomes part of our habit, right? How do we recognize where the edge, before slipping over too far? Well, that's a, a very subtle question, and we want to go into that carefully in, in this whole period. But I don't think you're going to recognize. I see. I think it's you'll see that uh, something much deeper is involved. To see, to get free of that is much more than just recognizing that difference. Right? But I, I see. What we have to do is to see some sort of notion of where the what sort of trouble we're in now. Right? In other words. We started out saying the trouble is the world is in chaos, but I think we end up by saying that thought is in chaos, right? I and mean, that's each one of us. In the, hmm? And that, that is the origin of the world in chaos. Right? Hmm? And then the chaos of the world adds, comes back and adds to the chaos of thought. Hmm? Did you mean to say that thought has a kind of possessive quality in which it stays, gets stuck? and then become habitual, and then we don't see it? <coughs> yeah, well, I think everything has that sort of quality that whenever we repeat something, it sort of gradually becomes a habit. I'll, I'll, perhaps I'll discuss that presently, but 
it's, it will be a key point, you see, and we, we get less and less aware of it, right? You know, you just, uh, if you brush your teeth every morning, you probably hardly notice how you're doing it, right? Hmm? It's a, 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 it just goes by itself. Our thought just does the same thing, and so do our feelings, right? <laughs> The employment of thought in the psychological sense, is that not synonymous with corruption? <clears throat> Why do you say that? Is, is there not only two states, corruption and innocence? Well, I don't know. You see, uh, but why, you see, I'm, I'm not saying yes or no. I'm trying to say, why are you saying this? You see, in other words, uh, uh, are you saying that thought by itself is incapable of innocence? Or that we simply in the, be... Hmm? In the psychological sense, it seems so. Yeah, is it so is the question. So it may seem so. I don't know, sir. Yeah, that's the question we're trying to explore, right? See, we'll admit the fact is it seems so. It seems as an appearance, right? Now the question is what is, what is actually the case, right? And we have to explore that. Hmm? Right, do you see what I mean? That this will take some digging into. We can't just take the way things seem and just work on that, because that, that would be another kind of mistake thought makes, just taking the surface and calling it the reality, right? Hmm. Yeah, I think it's really interesting what you say. I can see how, you know, if I have the intention to go someplace and I take the wrong road, it's no problem. I just, you know, next time I, take, I find out what the right road is, I change the information and I take a different road. But if both personally and collectively, often I have the intention to do something and it doesn't, it doesn't work out and yet I don't know what's wrong and that, you know, I won't, I can't seem to change the information or whatever and what I'm very interested in especially is how there's a sense of me separate from the information and from the intention and I feel like I'm this objective being that can change it and yet I can't seem to, or the world can't seem to. So the sense of, of me separate from the information, um, I think that's be something interesting to explore. Yes, well, we will try to get into that during this whole period. You see, that's another subtle question, but we have that feeling, as you say, that uh, what seems to be, and we don't necessarily accept what seems to be. See, if we accept what seems to be as what is, then we can't inquire. <laughs> I mean, if, if what seems to be were perfectly coherent, then I'd say, all right, why, why question it? <laughs> but since it's highly incoherent, I would say, uh, a good reason to question it. <clears throat> uh, that would be common sense in most er in ordinary areas of life. <laughs> now, the, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, it seems that all that's happening, that we all want to do things and we can't do what we want. Something else seems to happen that stops it. Now, that's, See, uh, 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 see, some of the people who are running corporations are getting interested in this question because they have the same problem. I know some people who are working in this area and they find that when their boards get together they can't seem to get the results. They can't agree and they can't get the results they intend either. <laughs> That's one of the reasons that they're sinking a bit. <laughs> and the, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, once again, uh, now, but there's a fellow who has written a book, Peter Senge, The Fifth Discipline. He has, he has analyzed some of these. I don't say he's got to the bottom of it, but it's interesting. He has made some sort of analysis which shows that very often it's because they are not following the, the effect of their thoughts. You see that when they think something and something is done, then it spreads out to other companies and then it comes back a bit later as if it were something else, right? Independent, is that clear? So they treat it as an independent problem and they keep on, thereby making it worse because they keep on doing the same thing. <coughs> so their way of thinking is creating a problem. It takes some time for the problem to get back to them. And they, by that time they've lost track of it. <laughs> and they say, here's a problem, and they think some more and they produce more of that problem. <laughs> <laughs> or else change the problem a bit into another one that's worse or whatever. So uh, the point is that they're not following, and they see that they are not aware of the effects of their thought, right? That the fact thought is active, participating. Hmm? Now you see, there is this feeling that when you are thinking something, it does nothing except inform you the way things are. 
And then you choose to do something and you do it. That, that's the way, common, the way people are talking, right? Hmm? But the way you think determines the way you're going to do it, and then, then you don't notice a result comes back, right? <laughs> you don't see it as a result of what you've done, or even less do you see it as a result of how you were thinking. Hmm? Is that clear? So, therefore, your problem... You see, all these problems that I described are the result of the way we've been thinking. That whole series of them, which are so depressing. <laughs> hmm? uh, but people don't see that. They say, we, we're just thinking. <laughs> Out there are the problems, and the thinking is telling us about those problems, <laughs> what they are. Hmm? So if I see a, a situation which seems so very obvious that, that a whole group of people are acting very incoherently, and then I think I see it very clearly that they're being incoherent, and then I start to act to correct that, I mean, I'm not noticing that my own thinking and my own may be incoherent and the action then will be all... No, because you're not <coughs> thinking, you may be caught in the same thing, you see. Yeah. In fact, we'll, you see that... Uh, because actually, how will you correct it? You see, if, you, if, unless, you ch unless their thinking changes, it won't be corrected. Now, nothing you do can change their thinking, huh? <laughs> except communication to them that they're, they're incoherent, uh, well, communication which they will accept <laughs> hmm? and understand. Hmm? Is that clear? Otherwise, you are, you are trying to meet thought with force, really, and it's kind of violence, you see. If you say, out there are some people behaving incoherently, and I will try to make them behave coherently, <laughs> uh, then you're using force, right? But they keep on thinking the same old way. They, if you're more powerful than they are, they will do what you want for a while until you get to be a little weak and they'll take care of you then. <laughs> so, with the possessive quality of thought, hmm? if I can bring it back again, it seems to me, it, it looks, it appears, and we'd like to explore it. Thought comes in from the outside, comes to the awareness, <coughs> takes over, takes possession, and maybe collectively take possession, and yeah. we can go to war, and we don't see it, because thought is possessive, like magic. It seems to take over. Yes, it takes over, and why does it take over? You see, the point is, see, there are two levels of this point. One is to describe the what happens as far as we can see outwardly, and secondly, to see the, 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 the source of it, right? Because unless we see the source of it, it will never change. So how can we explore the source? Yeah, well, that, that's, what we're going, that's what this whole series, uh, this weekend is about, right? <laughs> you see, but I think it's important to see what the question is, you see. see the first thing is to see there is a question that needs to be explored, right? Uh, right back there. Can thought be aware of itself? Well, that's a subtle question. You see, I think we, we'd have to, uh, uh, perhaps it would be best to leave that go for a while. Uh, not, uh, on the surface it appears it wouldn't be aware of itself if it's just memory. Uh, but uh, some kind of, we need some kind of awareness of what thought is doing, let's put it that way, that seems clear. But, which we don't have, generally speaking. Hmm? Proprocept, propro, what's that word you use? Uh, I used the word in previous times, proprioception, self-perception of thought, you see. And we'll come to that, you know, as we go along. But there may be a way to uh, get into this. But, I mean, uh, I think, you know, we should look at, you know, the, the thing, uh, you know, and. Uh, sort of a general way at this uh, for this evening. It would take us rather longer than this evening, but make available to go into that. Uh, <clears throat> now, that, there, that, that it's not by any means, it doesn't look entirely impossible that something we could approach this question somehow, but, uh, but it is a very difficult question. You see, uh, there are two reasons why it's difficult, which I would put. One of them is the mo that th th there's a fault in the process of thought. But what I mean by thought is all the whole thing. Thought, felt, the body, the, the whole society sharing thoughts. It's all one process. It's essential for me not to break that up because that's all one process. 
and somebody else's thoughts become my thoughts, you see, and vice versa. So, therefore, it would be wrong and misleading to break it up into my thought, your thought, my feelings, these feelings, those feelings. For some purposes, all right, but not for this purpose we're in now. Mm -hmm. Now, the, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, now, I, I would say that, that, that this thought makes what is now often called in modern language a system. A system means it's all put together, but it really, the way they're using the word commonly now, it means something all of whose parts are mutually interdependent uh, for their, not only for their mutual action, but for their meaning and their existence. You see, uh, you could say if you organize a corporation that is a system, you see, you have this department, that department, that department, they don't have any meaning separately, right? <laughs> they, they all con only can function together. Now, uh, the, uh, 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 in some sense, the body is a system, right? Uh, maybe a society is a system in some sense, now all the, and, and so on. Uh, now, I want to say that thought is a system. Thought, that system is not only includes felt feelings, it includes the state of the body, it includes the whole of society as its thought is passing back and forth. And a whole process by which thought evolved from ancient times or even before, right? A system is constantly engage in a process of development, change, evolution, its structure changes, and so on. Now, there are certain features of the system become relatively fixed. We call that the structure. You can see that in an organization, there's a certain structure. And that sometimes begins to break up because it doesn't work and people could change it. Right? Now, <clears throat> the, so we've got a, some structure in thought as well. I don't know if you can see some of it, but... Uh, which are some relatively fixed features, and, but it's been constantly evolving, you see, so we can't say that this structure began, never, you know, you can't say when it began, but with the growth of civilization it has developed a great deal. I think. It was probably very simple <coughs> the thought before civilization, and now it has become very complex and ramified and has meant much more incoherence than before. Uh, so, uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, so you have this system, right? And now I say that this system has a fault, and a systemic fault. It's not a fault here, or there, or there, but it is a fault that is all through the system, right? <laughs> Can you picture that? <laughs> uh, it's everywhere and nowhere, you see. So, uh, therefore, you may say, I see a problem here, but I bring my thought to bear on the problem, but my thought is part of the system. It has the same fault as the fault I'm trying to th look at, right? hmm? or a similar fault. Hmm? Uh, <clears throat> so we have uh, the systemic fault, and you see, you can see that that's what's been going on in all these problems of the world, that the fragmentation of nations has produced problems, and in dealing, we say here is a fault, something is going wrong, but in dealing with it, we use the same kind of fragmentary thought that produced the problem, just a somewhat different version of it. Hmm? Hmm? So, Therefore, it's not going to help and make, make things worse. Hmm? So, for example, you were saying, you know, you see all these things going wrong, and then you say, but what shall I do? I try to think about it. But my thought by now is pervaded with this systemic fault. Isn't that clear? Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Uh, so what, uh, what does that call for? Is it like the whole system has been polluted? Well, that's one way of looking at it, yes. <clears throat> uh, something has happened in the whole system which makes the thought wrong in the whole, uh, the whole process, not straight in the whole system, right? Any part of it, there may be bits of it which are okay, but, you know, it doesn't stay, right? I mean, you extend it. It's a bit like, I used to say, like the thing of saying the egg, which was rotten only in parts. You see, there might be some parts which haven't <laughs> been rotten, but <laughs> they'll spread, right? <laughs> you see, so, uh, the, uh, see, we, we can get some relatively clear thought in science, right? It's not entirely clear because scientists are worried about their prestige and status and so on. Sometimes they won't consider ideas that won't go along with that or with their prejudices or whatever, but 
uh, nevertheless, science was aimed at uh, not having that, right? It was aimed at saying, seeing this fact, whether you like it or not, and, uh, and, and looking at theories, you know, objectively and calmly and, <laughs> you know, without bias and so on. Uh, so, uh, uh, and then to some extent it was achieved better than in some other areas of life, right? So, therefore, some results flowed out of science and technology, which are quite impressive. The great power was released, and then, uh, but now we discover that in the use of science, all, all the, it, whenever the time comes to use science, we just forget sci the scientific method, right? <laughs> we just say, well, no, that was nice for the scientists to use the scientific method to make all that. And from now on, we say, well, the use of this thing will be determined by na needs of our country, by my need to make money, or by need to defeat that religion, or, you know, whatever, right? Or just my need to show what a great, pr powerful person I am, right? <laughs> so, uh, therefore, we now say, so we say relatively unpolluted thought has been used to uh, develop certain things, and then, and then we always trust to the most polluted thought to decide what to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's part of the incoherence, I'm just repeating it, but... It's being <laughs> Uh, are, you, are you saying that as we get into this pollution, we cannot see our true intentions? Well, not only, not only that, we, we don't know what our... We don't see that our intentions are incoherent, and perhaps that they, they are arising out of the pollution. I think um, as an individual, you know, we strive to resolve these things in ourselves, that what are our intentions and as individuals, what causes us to act or think the way we do. And at the same time, I see that part of the problems you describe, the global problems, are a different kind of problem that individuals haven't faced. You know, for example, individuals want to survive and want to reproduce. That's no longer possible in the sense that it was before, because a lot of our problems are we have too many people. So. There's both a, a working on this as an individual and somehow collectively realizing that we can't do the basic things individuals used to need to do, that something has to be changed. Yes, yeah, so that's quite true, but you see, we can't seem to do it. You see that the uh, uh, people trying to get together to deal with these things don't seem to be able to get very far. You know, like take the pollution or the ecological, the climate, you know, the change of climate or very little has been done on it. They say a lot of good words have been produced by various governments, but when it comes to putting a lot of money behind it, it hasn't got very far, you see. And the, the, therefore, there's very good intentions are counteracted by another set of intentions, or a whole bunch of sets of intentions, such as we've got to allow, the, we can't interfere with this, we can't interfere with that, we've got to allow this and that and that, and then it adds up to nothing. <laughs> so, <coughs> the... Uh, uh, therefore, it's the same incoherence that of course, our, the intentions we profess are blocked by another set that we not only don't profess, but may not know fully we've got. We may not want to know. Right? It seems to me that we have to like become aware of <laughs> certain assumptions which we've completely taken for granted and aren't even aware that we have. And that seems like we kind of have to go backwards and, you know, just question what our, what our assumptions are that we're taking for granted in the way we, in the system, in how we operate all the time. Because there's something that we're not even noticing, which is limiting our ability to make our intentions happen, both individually and collectively. Well... You see, uh, we're faced with this thing that I think uh, we're not really aware of what's happening in this, uh, in this system which I've called thought, right? We don't know how it works. We, don't, we hardly know it's a system. You see, it's not part of our culture to admit that it's a single system even, right? Hmm? Explain that system again. You said we're going to discuss this thought, but you were also including the emotional. Yeah. And what else were you including? The state of the body and also the whole society, the culture, the way we pass information between us and emotions and everything. Now, when you say the state of the body, are you also including the organs of the body? Well, anything, yes. The organs are affected by it. 
Okay, so when you say the organs are affected by it, in a sense you're you're making a distinction. Are, are you saying everything, is, somehow I'm hearing that you're saying the whole, this whole thing is a system, a closed system. Well, I wouldn't say it's entirely closed. No, I, yeah. It, it, a system isn't necessarily closed. It, it, you know, it can be uh, open to various influences or things coming in and out. That's the whole idea of the system. But uh, you see that uh, it's not necessarily closed, but it has a certain stability of structure. It tends to sustain and maintain its structure. So that when something from outside comes in, it reacts in such a way as to avoid a change, a basic change, right? Right, but I... I I'm hoping you're going to say that there is a possibility of, of opening up the structure or seeing it or being... Oh, yeah, 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 okay. there is, there is, yes. I'm, I'm not saying the system is everything there is. I'm, okay. I'm saying the system pervades our whole activity. Yes, I understand that. Do you get the distinction? It's like something pervading our activity, but it doesn't mean that it's all there is. But it, it, it actually has mm -hmm. become so pervasive it may be almost all that we are able to see much of the time. <laughs> so what is not in the system? Can we say what is not part of the system? Well, yes. Uh, well, we could say for the beginning that perhaps there is some kind of perception or intelligence which is, uh, 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 which is deeper, which is able to see this incoherence. You see, for example, if we say that the, see, the system itself could not very well see very, its incoherence very far because it, it would uh, distort it. Right? Now, I'm suggesting there is a, a capacity that th this th this system could be regarded as some sort of uh, well, as we've said, to a certain extent, it is necessary because we need this whole system of thought and so on hmm, for all sorts of purposes. Now, it has produced, a, it has developed a fault. Hmm. Now, the there is, I say, an intelligence and a perception which goes beyond memory. We can't see a fact, or we can't see an incoherence, just simply by way of, uh, you know, that, 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 that's the first step. There's a lot beyond this system. The system is actually only a very tiny part of reality, but, uh, the, uh, but it looms very large, and it would be very, unless you actually see the thing I'm talking about, what I say will be incorporated into the system <laughs> as an image which will not really convey, you see what I mean? Is that clear what the problem is? <coughs> you see that the system sort of tends to incorporate everything. Anything repeated several times becomes, a, a perception then repeated several times becomes part of the system. <laughs> so somebody may have had an insight and then it becomes part of the system. You, you excluded memory, uh, intuition from the system, didn't you? Well, it doesn't mean it depends on what you mean by it. I, mean, I think the system is able to have a kind of intuition that, in the sense that it may imitate, uh, 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 it may give a, mem a memory of intuition which sort of <laughs> feels a bit like intuition, you see. <laughs> but intuition would not be part of the system, would it? Not, not if it were truly so, yes. Uh, but but I, I'm saying there's perception, insight, there's intelligence, there's various things you can call it, which we'll, we'll try to bring it all out as we go along, which may not be part of the system. But let's put it now that I don't think it's that way, and that we're keeping it as a possibility, and we all may see some evidence that that system is not, every, and not everything, right? <laughs> hmm? If, uh, I'm sorry. Aren't there times that an action is considered right, a right by the individual? And, of course, that action taking place is a result of what you might call non-self-serving thought, and yet not trying to impose it on someone, but where there's a strong elements of, say, compassion and love in that uh, particular thought. Now, in that sense, isn't a, uh, uh, the fragmentation of thought uh, is not really uh, necessarily a part of that uh, activity? Is, uh, particularly if the point uh, of non -being, not being imposed, particularly if there's that sense of compassion and love in that action, uh, is that, is there a... Well, if there were such thing? compassion and love, then I would say it's not part of the system, clearly. But of course, a lot of what is felt to be compassion and love is, is actually part of the system. Huh? Because, you know, once again, in the, uh, such experiences, you know, become part, uh, repeated, become 
produce experiences that are uh, felt to be the same. You see? Mm -hmm. you see, so you see, it's this deceptive feature that we have to watch out for. That it's just in the question of what is not part of the system where the worst uh, confusion takes place. Right? <laughs> Because, see, if you confuse part of the system that is not part of the system, then you're, you're lost, right? <laughs> so you have to be very careful about that, right? You see that it's no use just saying love will take care of everything. You see, uh, people have said that for ages and it hasn't done it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the Christian religion was based on the idea that God is love and they said we have one God who is pure love and so on and so on, Christ. and. Nevertheless, they fought each other, not only fought other religions, but they fought each other very violently over very violent religious wars lasting centuries and so on, with the terrible things. Now, and I, I'm sure that these people didn't intend to get into that, you see, but, but because of the way they were thinking about their religion, they couldn't help it. They, they had another intention. The theological question took over, for example, from love, or the question of the religion being connected with the monarch of power, or this or that. You see, so it doesn't stop it to just say we're all based on love, because <laughs> nevertheless it still can be absorbed into the system, right? Hmm? It can be an invention of the system. What? It can be an invention of the system talking about love. Yes, well, the and also, uh, yes, well, if you like to call it an invention, or see, I, I'll, I'll try to develop that a little later, how, what, how to look at that, I think to look at it. Uh, now, does anybody else, you, did you have something? Well, it's just that uh, if my whole life, all that I've ever known lies within the system, then any notion of there being anything outside of that is only a notion of the system. And I can't have any idea what that would mean. Yeah, well, yes, we don't know what it means, but we, we have to entertain the idea. You see, I think we have to be careful not to paint ourselves into a corner there. You see, that to say everything is in the system, there's no way out of it. No, I'm not saying that, it's just that I might get the notion that I could visualize yeah. something which was outside, and that would be... Uh, that would still be inside, you see. Right. And see, that's why I say that becomes the most dangerous source of confusion, because then you say, that's outside, that's all right. <laughs> hmm? So in that way, thought produces something that says to be outside, and it doesn't say, notice that that's one of the basic mistakes. Thought produces that and says, I didn't produce it, it's really there. Hmm? So when you're saying that, in a way, we should uh, see the... Well, no, let me put it differently. So you're saying that we should see the difference between what is the system and what is not the system, instead of using thought to establish a boundary there, which yeah. probably yeah. would lead to a fragmentation. If, if, we could, that if we could see it, but you see, I don't know how are we going to see it is the question, you see. I'm, yeah, I guess I'm just wondering, I mean, there have been a lot of times when people have have had insights into particular systems or, you know, become aware of something and made a major change like there was, you know, pre-science and then there was science or there's a lot of examples like that where people did have a change, a radical change in a more limited sphere. I'm wondering if looking at how they did it in that area would be useful or relevant to, you know, getting to the root of this whole system. Well, do you have something in mind? Well, yeah, like, like that, I guess, like how they went from, how did human beings manage to go from never having science to having science, for example? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, that, that's an interesting point, and that, um, you know, how, how was it possible for scientific knowledge to develop, which was quite contrary to the previous culture? <laughs> And, and see, that's an interest. And see, uh, that required what I would like to call insight. Now, the uh, uh, I can give you several examples. You see, uh, in, in, in Greek times and ancient, and uh, also in the, uh, up to and through the Middle Ages, people believed that. See, the ancient Greek idea was that the Earth was at the center of the universe, and there were seven crystal spheres of increasing perfection. That heaven was that the seventh one was the perfect. One. And, saying, and then saying that celestial bodies should, being perfect, should move in perfect figures. The only perfect figure is a circle. 
So therefore, they said they ought to be moving in circles, huh? right? They, see, so they, they uh, and then when they found they weren't, they said, well, it's not actually a circle, but we can make it up out of circles on top of cir circles called epicycles, and uh, save the appearances, as they said. And they, but the basic idea was this order of increasing perfection, and also the idea that each uh, thing is striving to reach its right place. It was a highly organic view of the universe, right? Hmm? Everything had its place and so on. And uh, the, uh, now, uh, but when people found that it wasn't working too well, they tended to move to save it rather than to question it seriously, right? Hmm. Now, uh, well, gradually evidence accumulated, especially after the end of the Middle Ages, that there wasn't a great difference of heavenly and earthly matter, you see. Uh, well, for example, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the, the, the moon, for example, had a lot of irregular features on it. It wasn't very perfect. And other planets had satellites, not only the Earth and, 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 and so on. You see, the, uh, you didn't see a lot of evidence that heavenly matter and earthly matter were all that different, right? Hmm. But still, there was the idea that heavenly matter is basically different. Hmm. Hmm. It's heavenly, it's perfect. Right? Hmm. It belongs up there. It stays up there where it belongs. Huh? <laughs> and th therefore, nobody, everybody was satisfied, you see. Hmm? Now, uh, but there was a gradually, uh, but there was enough evidence by the time of Newton or even before to question that seriously. But and many people may have done so, but not, there's a sort of an unconscious level where it still works, right? <laughs> hmm? Saying, why does the moon stay up in the sky? It's only natural, it's celestial matter, it stays up where it belongs, right? Hmm? You see, nobody worries about why it isn't falling, right? <laughs> so, uh, and, and the, and that explanation may have made sense in ancient times, but there was enough evidence to question it. Huh? But uh, the, there's a whole habit in the mind not to question it. Right? Let's take it for granted. Huh? Then, uh, you see, the... Uh, uh, now, the story is, whether it's true or not, I don't know, that Newton was watching the apple fall, and he must have had the insight that, see, the question what may have been in the mind, why isn't the moon falling? And he suddenly had the answer, the moon is falling. <laughs> right? That's the force of universal gravitation, right? that everything is falling toward everything. Hmm. And then he had to explain why it doesn't reach the ground, which he was able to do later by some cal calculation, showing it was also going outward. Because it was far away, it was moving away in a fast orbit that kept it off the ground right? while it was still falling. Hmm? So he, uh, he had an insight, he must have had an insight at that moment, you see, which broke that old mold of thought, right? Hmm? Saying, why, people would ask, if anybody ever asked why the moon isn't falling, he would quickly, he wouldn't even bother with the question, right? <laughs> because it was so natural that it belongs, it stays where it belongs. Right? But then, um, by breaking that thought, then, then from there on, uh, the, the key point of the insight was to break the old mode of thought. Right? From there on, it was not so difficult to go to the new one, because you could say, if the moon is falling, then there is universal gravitation, everything is falling, and you can then go on from there. Right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, th there were other cases of that kind, you say, but... Uh, and this led to the more modern view, but now this more modern view is just as rigidly fixed as the ancient view was. <laughs> you see, it would take some sort of something to break that too, right? <laughs> now, the, uh, another, to say that that is the absolute truth, final, no, no more questions need to be asked, and so on. You see that the, uh, um, so, uh, 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 <coughs> there is an insight which is possible, and we'll come back to this again which can break that old mode of thought. We have to really look at that, you know, think about it, and first think about it, and then see what we can see. It. And, and that opens the way to something else. Hmm? Now, of course, it only broke in some limited domain, right? It didn't break in this vast area that we've been talking about. <laughs> All these insights in science were ultimately assimilated within the system, right? <laughs> When you say we have to think about it, isn't that the system doing the thing? It may be or may not be. I'm trying to say 
See, I, I think we shouldn't have prejudged the issue. I'm saying it may be possible in a flash for suddenly some real thinking to take place. We, it must happen occasionally or else where would we be? <laughs> I mean, we would never have got anywhere at all, right? <laughs> if we use the kind of thought we use in nationalism to deal with practical problems all the time, we would have been dead long ago, you see. It would be correct to say that the um, that Newton's insight was um, seeing the um, seeing that the natural state of everything is not motionlessness, but well, that, that was even before that. You see that, that, that there was already another insight, which was that the natural state of thing is to be in motion. You see that I didn't give the full story of it. I uh, sort of focused on one point of gravitation. Hmm. Maybe a how of what you were saying was very interesting in the fact that he was able to question the wrong question that he wasn't supposed to ask. It was kind of a forbidden question to question what was religious he was not supposed to ask. And then breaking the pattern of thinking. Well, you see, that it often happens that when you ask what you call a wrong question, is a question which already assumes the thing that ought to be questioned, you see. It's called begging the question. <laughs> now, uh, the, uh, 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 he was at, see, I don't know whether he was asking, people were generally asking the wrong questions because they were not aware of the importance of the question of why the moon isn't falling, right? Mm -hmm. So they might have asked if, well, why is the moon going from here to there? Why is the, this planet going in this particular set of epicycles and so on? See, that would have been the wrong, a wrong question because it would have assumed all these epicycles which are not really relevant <laughs> in the actual situation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, therefore, you're led, because you don't question that whole structure, you're led to ask a lot of other questions that have no particular, no great meaning. Huh? <coughs> and they get you in deeper. <laughs> now, see, your questions contain assumptions. That's the point, right? Therefore, when you question the question, you are questioning some, a deeper assumption, right? But that's done non-verbally. Do you see what I mean? To question the question eventually has to be a non-verbal act, which uh, you can't describe. Huh? And as it happens, it breaks all the pattern. Yeah, somehow it breaks the pattern. And we want to go into that a lot. You see, uh, in other words, that. This pattern is not just something that, you know, is, we're stuck with, it's inevitable, absolutely inevitable. There are signs that it could break, right? Mm. What do you mean when you say that it's non-verbal? Well, I don't know. You see, if I say I have a question which may contain assumptions that should be questioned, and I could question them verbally, but you see, well, what would lead me to question my question? <laughs> Eventually, I can put it in words, but I'm saying the first step, the first flash of insight is not verbal. Do you see what I mean? Well, those perceptions huh? were in the absence of thought, and then thought became a product of the perception. Yeah, it was affected by the perceptions, right? right. Hmm? It, it took a new turn because of those perceptions. Hmm? If that insight isn't thought, then what is it? Oh, well, I don't know. You see, we, we, we really have to go into that carefully. You see, I, see, how would we answer that? You see, you see I can ask a question. <laughs> uh, see, if, if we're answering it by thought, then thought can't answer it, right? <laughs> you see, so, but on the other hand, thought could still say something about it, which might help, help us toward the question, right? Hmm? Yeah, see, we're not trying to say thought is always a culprit or always bad. It can also sometimes, in many cases, be right, not only technically, but in other areas. And, but uh, the, uh, uh, we need, but you see, I think that that kind of thought that would come in a thing like this, you see, is a sudden feeling of waking up a bit, right? Hmm? Hmm? Um, on the inside, is there a, an unlimited pool of insight that any one of us <coughs> could be in touch with if there's a pause in thought? Well, maybe, you see, I mean, see, well, how would I answer it again, you see? <laughs> <laughs> where does the, where does this insight... No, but I'm trying to say, look at the question, you see, hmm? you see, you see I'm saying this is a matter of we're learning to question the question. Uh, is there an assumption there that I could tell you yes or no? <coughs> If I can't tell you, then what are we going to do? 
question. What? Yeah. You say, don't answer it right away. You see, it may. Newton took a long time before he even got to the question. <laughs> and he was quite bright. <laughs> Perception take place that uh, help us to see the, how impatient we are, meaning the, how, how thought is, uh, likes to have too fast uh, explaining answers. Well, we can look at that too. We want the answer right away. And, uh, we want and then to make that help us to start being a little bit more careful to slow down. But why do we want the answer right away? <laughs> Is that right? I don't know if that means we're not interested in the question, you see. Hmm? I mean, be, if our real interest is to get on with another question, then we're not going to do this one very well. <laughs> Maybe it's like That's what we do. <laughs> Maybe it's like the computer who speaks once right away to have informations and conclusions, informations and assumptions right away. Maybe it is the nature of the machinery, the machinery nature of thought. Well, that may be, but then we have to ask, you know, why do we allow ourselves to be subjugated by this machinery? Right? Could it mean that it gives us security to get the answer real quickly and uh, we feel oriented and it gives us a sensation of security? Yeah, well, that may all be, but you see, you could have said the same about Newton, that if he had the, he may have wanted the answer right away. This question may have been disturbing, and, you know, to, dis to, to raise fundamental questions even in science can be very disturbing. And somebody could feel, I'd like to have the answer right away and get out of this unpleasant state of disturbance, and he would never get anywhere. Right? Hmm. It's generally an uncomfortable, it's uncomfortable not to, uh, not to know something. Yeah, but then Newton must have been in some state of not knowing. Other scientists, I don't really pick on Newton, uh, uh, who must have been in some state of not knowing for some period, or some state of even confusion and very unpleasant you know, incoherence and some possibly unpleasant feelings, right? Hmm? Or maybe he had an intuition. Well, not, that came, but I think he worked on it quite a while. I mean, he must have gone through long periods when it needn't have been always pleasant. Right? Hmm? So to some extent, we have to sustain the incoherence. What do you mean? Say, sustain in the way that uh, not to get rid of it immediately when yeah. it comes. Yeah, you say it's a mistake to try to get rid of the incoherence before you actually see, <laughs> get rid of it, right? <laughs> 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 if you see what I mean. <laughs> I mean, it only creates, the system creates the, the appearance or the seeming of getting rid of it. Huh? No, so, you see, if you're, we, we seem, the system seems to want to relieve the pressure without actually getting to the root of the thing. Well, that's again the same problem and the same flaw in another way, isn't it? <laughs> the same fault that we've been talking about, that we don't stay with that's a pervasive fault in the system. It doesn't stay with a, pro a difficult problem that produces unpleasant feelings. It's conditioned somehow to move as fast as it can toward more pleasant feelings without actually facing the thing that's making the unpleasant feeling. <coughs> that um, thing about the unpleasant feeling and the confusion, <coughs> that might be a learned thing that comes later. Because I've seen a child attempting to do some sort of puzzle, say, and without any sense of confusion or pain, just interest again and again and again, attempting until maybe finally they succeeded. And so I wonder, uh, I've been thinking about this, <laughs> does learning come out of confusion? Well, or does learning come out of a willingness to face something that doesn't have any immediate answer, but it isn't necessarily unpleasant, it's just sort of an abeyance. Well, that may well be, but we have to consider the state of the system which has evolved with our civilization <laughs> over thousands and thousands of years, which is that we have a lot of bad experience connected with not having the answers, <laughs> and one way or another. <laughs> and therefore, there's a reaction immediately, we want the answer right away. Huh? And there's a feeling of, it's the memory of all the unpleasant experiences of not having the answer, right? <coughs> Those felt bob up, right? Hmm? Many, many, child, many children are, are um, 
pushed to to have the right so have the solution. Uh, yeah, well, they're rewarded with the right solution, and that they face on a certain amount of unpleasantness if they don't have it, and. Uh, the educational system does that, the whole economic system does that. See, everything has grown, the political system, it has all grown up to do that, right? right. Now, that's by now part of the system. <laughs> so we have to say, here we are in the system, and what are we going to do with it? So if we face, un if there is unpleasantness, it would be very fine to say we shouldn't have it. That would, be, that would be very good. But since we have it, we have to say, what are we going to do with it? What, what will be our response? Huh? Can we get sensitive to that here? Yeah, well, let's see if we can. It seems that it's not just a, an intellectual thing, even listening to our voices here, mm -hmm. mine, and moving around. There's a, it is someness tone in the way that we talk to each other, which is, the little kid picks it up and that's, I know, mm -hmm. I know. Right, well, can we fa uh, see? Can we face it here? Is there any unpleasantness here in facing the, the uncertainty or the unknown? Hmm. Right. <coughs> you see, if there is, you see, you'll notice there's a tremendous movement away from. That's the system set up to move away from that, right? right. From awareness of that. Now, you can see that if we, by inference, by just thinking about it clearly, we can see that if we keep on doing that, that it makes no sense and the result must be real disaster, right? Hmm? You see, yet we find, so we could say, my intention is not to do it, but you'll still have the, you'll still find yourself doing it. So you have a sort of resistance coming from something else, huh? from the system, for whatever. We'll call it for the moment. Hmm? Would uh, one part of the fault in the system that we do not understand what is the role of incoherence in the in learning and in the system? That we either try to get it get it, you know get out of it immediately, or, or else we sustain it indefinitely. But we don't seem to find the middle golden mean or the middle way with incoherence in a way, letting it unfold itself sufficiently for us to understand what's going well, on. Well, sometimes we do. I think we understand perfectly well how that works, because everybody does it in areas where they're not too important to him. Right? We would need sensitivity to see what's what the meaning. Yeah, but again, the system is not sensitive, you see. It destroys it. You see that the system interferes with it, right? But then are you saying we do not actually see the incoherence of not you know, responding to incoherence in the well, mind. I don't know whether we see really it. Matter. Do we see it or don't we see it? It's a bit puzzling, isn't it? You see, you see, sometimes it seems we see it. You see, in an elementary technical sense, uh, when you see incoherence and it's not worrying you or frightening you, you actually do all that you said, don't, don't People uh, do use incoherence. Uh, they begin to look at it and do exactly what you said. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> You know, saying, you know, if there's not too worried about it, that's exactly what people do. Hmm? But uh, when people find it's something important to them, then they can't seem to do it, right? It seems to me that um, in what you're saying here, we have to um, it's like re educate our system and to, to I don't know how to use the right words, but. To understand that when we're in this uh, state of confusion or um, anxiety of not having an answer, that there may be a possibility. It would seem like we have to actually articulate that for the system before my, I might even attempt to experience that. Well, I don't quite get how you do it. Well, we have been educated to have an answer, okay? All my life, you know, as soon as a teacher asks a question or whatever, if I have the answer, I'm, you know, a good kid. And then I hear for the first time, whether it's here or so many years ago, that actually if I don't have the answer, I'm a good kid. Okay? So, so I am... <laughs> I'm, I'm enlarging the system. I'm actually broadening it to include something new that I never even conceived would be a possibility. It was just such a... A, a small thing that I had learned that was so deep. Well, so, uh, yeah. Well, I'm just wondering, in a way, aren't we here 
doing two things in a sense. We're actually um, hearing that it's okay, you know, that it might be actually interesting to be confused. See, if I'm anxious, it's going to be hard for me not to want to find an answer to something. So I'm going to see this movement and not have that have any space. And if I hear, well, maybe anxiety is okay, that in itself may actually reduce the anxiety. Um, oh, it may, yeah. <laughs> in some cases, I think, but I mean, but, but when you're really anxious, I'm not, I'm not sure it would work. You see, <laughs> you see, that is, if you got some situation that produced, uh, you know, involving you, your, your interest very deeply, which was in danger, you know, that was real. You see, if somebody, well, nowadays people may be anxious about losing their jobs, for example, and they could become very anxious about that. Now, they could think, well, being anxious is all right, but. <laughs> I'm not sure it would help them very much at that level, you see. No, I, I'm, not, I'm sorry. I, what I'm just su suggesting is that if, if, we, um, if, we learn, if we hear within the system... Yeah, I understand what you mean, yeah. That, that not having the answer is, is, a, is not only okay, but it actually may have some, some yeah. negative implications. Then to find myself in a situation where I'm, I would normally be anxious because I don't have the answer, uh -huh. there may be a willingness to, 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 to drop trying to have the answer. Um, yeah, that, that might help, but I think that it wouldn't be enough to solve it. You see, uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, you see, uh, yeah, I think it, would, it could help relax it a bit. And uh, uh, you see, uh, the, and even there, I would like to say one more point that it's not merely that you have heard that this is all right, but you must have seen that it's all right. You see, uh, in other words, it would be still part of the system if you merely took my word that it's all right. You see what I mean? That, but actually, having heard it, you saw that it was that it made sense, right? Yeah, I, I think what? that. Yes, I, I hear what you're saying. You have to have a display, is what you're saying. Well, but you have to see that it makes sense. You see that it's coherent. In other words, that that what that this would be the coherent way to uh, function or operate. Hmm? To allow anxiety to be there, if, uh, if you're anxious, you've got to say, that's it, I'm anxious. That's part of the whole situation, right? Hmm? But then you have to notice that the mind is conditioned, or the system is conditioned to move away from that anyway. Mm -hmm. hmm? And that's also part of what you have to be aware of. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So I was saying, by saying all this, we have begun to move and by seeing it, and seeing the, that it makes sense, it's coherent, oh, yeah. then a certain move has begun uh, loosening up the system. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, I think that's just what I was saying. <laughs> yeah, I know. No, that's what I meant. I, it is what you're saying, but I put it in oh, other words. Oh, yeah, much nicer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, the... Uh, now, so it, it shows that this system is not a monolithic rock wall, you see. Hmm. No, that it, it's, it's actually re really very, not solid at all, you see, but it looks extremely solid. Huh? Are you asking whether we can learn to become more learning-oriented individually and, and collectively? rather than I-know-oriented? Well, that's part of it. And the other part is to say that when we're looking into the impulses and feelings and anxieties which push us away from that. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, instead of saying, that's terrible, I'm anxious, I must quickly find some thought that relieves the anxiety. Saying that anxiety is perfectly normal in this, it's to be expected in this situation. It's an opportunity to learn. It's an opportunity to learn, yes. Hmm? Now that's a reversal of most of our culture. <laughs> now, so you don't accept it there for it, you see, but it, say if you see that it makes sense and it's coherent, it doesn't prove it's right, but say at least it suggests it's a good approach. Huh? Hmm. Right. Before what you shun suddenly becomes valuable, as he said, it's an yeah. opportunity. Yeah. Now, you see, Krishnamurti used to use words like that saying that uh, Envy or sorrow is a jewel, you see. Uh, so you would say, how can I say such things? <laughs> uh, terrible things, you see. <laughs> but the, uh, the point is that if you look at it differently, you can see that this is just what you've got to learn, what's going on there, you see, what it means. Huh? In other words, that 
all these things are now the fact that you have all this going on which you don't really want is a sign that there's incoherence. <laughs> Are we saying that we call to us what we need to learn? What? Are we saying in a way that we call to us what we need to learn? I don't quite get it. I don't. <laughs> no. Well, um, I don't know how else to put it. Do I call it? What was the words? Well, do we attract, attract what we need to learn? Well, I think rather we acknowledge that things that seem to, things that we ought to get rid of are actually the clue to what we need to learn. You see that our whole culture and our whole instinct has told us these are things we've got to get rid of as quick as we can. <laughs> but now I've suggested reasons why maybe they are the things we they're the this the, the source the clue for learning. Right? Or they're the by from there we can begin to learn. Huh? And since we don't look at them, that's why we never do learn, right? That's one reason, anyway. So at least that alone would explain. There are probably a lot of other reasons, but uh, the uh, <clears throat> so so that, that, that's a point then that it's part of the system. See, our whole culture is part of the system, isn't it? To say that that's what we should do, and in addition, there's some instinctive tendency in that direction, anyway. You know, to get rid of whatever is painful which makes sense in certain areas, say such as a toothache or something, to do, you know, deal with the tooth, you see, to stop the pain, you see. But even there it could be wrong. If your only intention was to get rid of the pain, you might just use, use various drugs to relieve the pain until the tooth rots, right? <laughs> you see. See, if the pain is an indicator of something wrong, it should be looked at in that way. Mm -hmm. Something which is not coherent, right? Is going on. <laughs> That's interesting because uh, psychological pain is an indication of something wrong, but usually we try to think what the wrongness is, whereas the wrongness is the actual uh, incoherent, the disturbance, which is a signal of the incoherence. Uh, maybe I don't make sense. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the, the point is this, it's very hard to get this straight, but we'll have to finish up in a short time now. The, uh, the pain is in some way a sign that uh, a result of a certain kind of incoherence. Maybe biological pain also very often is because you have in the tooth some process, a bacterial process going on, attacking the cells, which is not coherent with their operation. And pain is a warning of that, right? Now, uh, the... Uh, so pain, I think, in general, could be looked at that way, that pain... And there are people who cannot feel pain and they really hurt themselves all the time. They, 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 you know, their pain nerves are damaged. So, uh, and in fact, epilepsy seems to be that, that the pain, those nerves, it's an attack on the nerves which prevents you from realizing, and from feeling pain, so that these people destroy their muscles by using too much force. It's been observed, watched carefully that the destruction of ep epilepsy comes from people using too much force in everything they do. Not, I mean leprosy, I'm sorry, I must be getting sleepy. Leprosy. Uh, it's lep leprosy is uh, uh, people, the pain nerves are somewhat damaged by the disease, right? They cannot tell how much force they are using. and They have observed they're using fantastic amounts of force which destroy the whole system. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, uh, Therefore, you can see that pain has a necessary function. And uh, the instinctive wish to get rid of the pain, which works in the animal level, is not working here with thought. Right? Uh, that instinct is not good enough. You see, you've got to... Uh, something much more deep and subtle is needed. Pain could also be thought. Well, thought can be painful, right? The thought of, uh, of what an idiotic thing you've done, or, or you know, say what a fool you've made of yourself, could be very painful, right? Hmm? <laughs> Although in some other cases, it, it could be more like perception, something not yeah. so much coming from thought. Yes, but, I, but even so, that pain is something to be perceived. Even if it comes from thought, there is a perception needed, if you say, to learn. Hmm? Well, the pain doesn't come from thought. I'm just playing with it. 
The pain is something I generate in me in response to the thought. Well, but it's part of the generalized thought in the sense I'm using the word, right? Of the whole bodily response. Hmm? But see, if I didn't understand that, I would try to solve the problem of the pain which I am generating through my thinking. Whereas, I am in a sense deliberately paining myself in response to a thought, unbeknownst to myself. Yeah, you're, you're hurting yourself is a, a simple way to put it, that uh, you see, and that's really, uh, uh, you know, so that... that but once, <coughs> once the thought is there, doesn't it, uh, once that image is there, isn't the response often immediate? I mean, it's not that we're doing it to ourselves so much as that the thought itself seems to bring physical pain, doesn't it? Yeah, well, that's part of this generalized... Pro I'm trying to say thought is never just thought, it's also the bodily state, the feeling. You see those nerves, just whatever is going on in the intellectual part just connects with everything else, right? <coughs> it flows out so fast that you can't keep it in one place, right? Hmm? So that a thought of a certain kind will produce either pleasure or pain. Hmm? You said that it gets involved. Yeah, at least the memory of it. Hmm? Right. Isn't it an immediate thing, though? With that, I mean, it's directly wired into the, the nervous system? Well, I don't know how fast it is. You see, it could take a second or two before you feel the pain. Right? If it, you may, it takes a second or two for the impulse to get down to the solar plexus where you might feel the pain, you see. And you say, you know, my heart is broken or something. Right? <laughs> Well, this is interesting then, because I think the question that was brought up, that maybe it isn't the thought then, but we are doing something if there is a, if there's a lapse time there. That's what I'm wondering about. Well, I'm wondering, but we're not doing anything. See, I've discussed that. It's all, I'm trying to get across a different picture, which is uh -huh. that it's one process, unbroken. Right. And we're not doing anything. Okay. That's right? what I'm asking. Yeah. We it's are. going on by itself, but the thought is saying, uh, you're, we're doing it, right? Right. right. Hmm? No, that's... No. Well. The, the thought is that it is being done to me. Like you said something, and yeah. therefore I am hurt, and I actually yeah. physically hurt. Yeah, yeah well, right. That's, uh, the thought is double. The thought is that the thinking is being done by me, and the pain is being done by you, right? right. <laughs> Whereas the pain is being done by me. <laughs> well, by the same thought that, is, is, that does it all in the first place, right? <laughs> is, is it because the emotion mediates the process that is so fast? Well, the emotion is very fast, that's true, yeah. The pain is always mediated by emotion. Yeah, but it may take a second or two before, you know, the emotional center is hit very quickly, but then there's another center down in the solar plexus that takes longer. But anyway, I think we should uh, not continue this, uh, you know, I'm sure that people are very, seem very interested, but uh, the... Uh, it's quarter to ten, which is a bit later than we usually go, and uh, we start, remember, tomorrow morning at ten, and the place is open 9.30, right? And if, if uh, during the night you go over this and think or feel some of it, maybe we could discuss it tomorrow, right? So we could start tomorrow by discussing whatever you, uh, you may learn. Right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.